Hey everyone! I saw a lot of movies last month, but I'm gonna try to keep this quick, so let's get started. First up, 2016's La La Land. Movie musicals can be hit or miss with me, even though I like musicals, so in spite of the hype, I wasn't super excited to see this one. And, you know, it did take me several scenes to get into it. But then, I don't know, it suddenly worked. I got pulled in. I enjoyed its exhilaration and energy, the way it exists in this vague, magical space in both the past and the present. I enjoyed the brilliant colors and the old movie references. I was pleasantly surprised by Emma Stone and Ryan Gosling, especially in their one-take performances, and I liked the music. I've come to like it so much, I rented the piano score from my library. A lot of it's beyond my capabilities as a piano player, honestly, but I don't care. I'm gonna play the dickens out of what I can manage, because it's fun. The next two movies were included on Universal's Wolfman Legacy Collection DVD set, Werewolf of London and She-Wolf of London. I briefly mentioned 1935's Werewolf of London in my Wolfman review a couple weeks ago. It was interesting to me to observe Universal's previous effort in the werewolf genre, as this came out six years before its more famous successor. I like the Wolfman better, for numerous reasons, but Werewolf of London was alright on its own. Henry Hull's performance is not nearly as sympathetic as Lon Chaney Jr.'s, but the movie's a sufficiently entertaining mystery, with strong doses of black humor and a creative, low-budget transformation effect. Werewolf of London's inclusion on the Wolfman DVD set makes sense. The inclusion of 1946's She-Wolf of London was a bit of a stretch, because it's not really a werewolf movie at all. Still, aside from the fact that its title is misleading, possibly to capitalize on the Wolfman's success, and it wasn't at all like what I'd expected, I don't think it was a bad movie. It's more a psychological thriller than a werewolf movie, with June Lockhart playing a vulnerable, disturbed young woman who fears she bears the family werewolf curse. As such, it's compelling enough, and in some respects, it actually has more in common with cat people than with the Wolfman. I saw two movies about Winston Churchill this month. One was 2002's HBO film The Gathering Storm, which was a superbly acted film starring Albert Finney as Churchill in the period leading up to World War II. I liked the story's emphasis on his relationship with his wife, played by Vanessa Redgrave. All the supporting characters were excellent as well, which is no surprise considering the cast, which includes Tom Wilkinson, Hugh Bonneville, Linus Roach, Lena Headey, Derek Jacobi, Jim Broadbent, and there's a baby-faced Tom Hiddleston, too. It was a humorous film at times, but also a frustrating one, considering the material, as Churchill tries to get England to listen to his repeated warnings about Germany. A week or so after we watched that, we followed it up with 2009's Into the Storm which is a sequel of sorts, except with a completely different cast. Brendan Gleeson was very good as Churchill, though I think I preferred Finney's performance. The timeline of this one was a little harder to follow, going back and forth between the beginning of the war and the re-election of 1945. It does have all of World War II to cover in one movie, while also keeping Churchill's personal struggles in the foreground, so it only focuses briefly on highlights, like Dunkirk, the Blitz, and Battle of Britain, and his meetings with Roosevelt and Stalin. I especially liked the scenes between Churchill and King George VI, who was played very well by Ian Glenn. While we're on the subject, I might as well tell you about some of the other war movies that I saw this month. One was 2015's The Last Rescue, a tense little movie about five people stranded in Nazi-held territory. Part of the scenario is unrealistic, but it's still entertaining. Another was 2002's Wind Talkers, about the Navajo Code Talkers. Nicolas Cage's character is assigned to protect one of the Navajo, played by Adam Beach. Cage's character has a lot of issues and wants nothing to do with anybody, but a bond starts to form between him and the man who, in the event of imminent capture, Cage is supposed to kill. It's a tense movie. Not perfect, but with some good moments. We also saw 1942's One of Our Aircraft is Missing, about a British bomber whose crew manages to bail out before their plane crashes in Nazi-occupied Holland. This is a Powell and Pressburger movie. A couple of you have recommended that I watch more of their war films. 
Actually, it turns out I had seen this before. It was only a couple years ago that we watched it, so I feel a little sheepish. Plus, I remember now that I was really sleepy when we watched it the first time and I kept nodding off, which is no way to watch a war movie, or any movie for that matter. Anyway, I'm really glad that we decided to rewatch it because it was a very good movie, both as an RAF film and as a Dutch resistance film. It had a lot of elements I like, a small group trying to survive, camaraderie and banter among the flight crew, memorable characters making brief but important appearances along the way, so thanks to those of you who brought it back to my attention. And the last war movie this time is 2013's The Railway Man. This was an excellently acted movie based on a true story about a man, played by Colin Firth, who's haunted by memories of his experiences as a soldier taken prisoner by the Japanese after the fall of Singapore. The movie goes back and forth in time, in the 80s as his new wife, played by Nicole Kidman, tries to learn his secret history and help him confront it, and back during the war with Jeremy Irvine playing him as a young man. Colin Firth delivers a difficult, moving performance, as does Hiroyuki Sanada in the latter part of the film. Heads up, there are a couple scenes of torture which I found difficult to watch, more difficult than some of the bloody battle scenes in other movies I've seen this year. However, it was still a really good movie. And now for something completely different. Jailhouse Rock and Elvis, that's the way it is. When it was Elvis Presley Day on Turner Classic Movies, I happened to catch most of Jailhouse Rock, which I'd never seen before. I don't think I'd ever seen any Elvis movie in its entirety, so this was unusual. And it was cool to see the famous Jailhouse Rock number in context. As for Elvis, that's the way it is, I'd actually seen most of this before, which is funny, because I'm not necessarily a huge Elvis fan. But it's so interesting to see him in rehearsals, being a genuinely funny, easygoing goofball, but also effortlessly talented. And then when he takes the stage, he impresses you all over again with his tireless showmanship. It's really fun. I also saw Disney's Beauty and the Beast live-action remake. I've been asked what I thought of it, so here you go. I was and still am of the camp that this live-action version didn't need to be made, but I tried to go into it with an open mind. Um, it was alright. Some stuff was good. Some stuff was not. The cast, for the most part, did a fine job, with the majority of the actors giving solid vocal performances. The weakest link was its star, Emma Watson. I would have been able to excuse her lackluster singing if her acting had been good, but in neither department did she impress. So, I didn't hate the movie. There were certain scenes I enjoyed, and I might listen to a couple songs from the soundtrack. I thought the new Beast song, Evermore, was rather impressive and memorable. However, as regards the movie as a whole, I don't imagine I'll want to see it again anytime soon. Moving right along, Mom and I watched 1954's Elephant Walk which stars Elizabeth Taylor as a woman who, after a whirlwind romance, marries Peter Finch's plantation owner and goes to live with him in British Ceylon. Unfortunately, Taylor is troubled to find that her new husband's behavior has changed, that the property lies defiantly across an elephant pathway, and that the household is haunted by the overpowering memory of Finch's dead father. The only sympathetic person around who Taylor can talk to is her husband's manager, played by Dana Andrews, who is more than willing to give Taylor his attention. I like old movies set in hot, dangerous jungle settings for some reason, and I enjoyed this one. Elizabeth Taylor's wardrobe, designed by Edith Head, is gorgeous, and her hair and makeup always flawless, even after she's been crying. Peter Finch and Dana Andrews are both appealing in their disparate ways, and the final climax has some pretty intense and exciting special effects for a movie about an unhappy newlywed. After several months, I finally got to see 1955's Blackboard Jungle. Glenn Ford plays a teacher starting a new job at a difficult inner-city school. I liked the movie, though not as much as I liked Up the Down Staircase and To Sir With Love. Incidentally, Sidney Poitier is in this movie, 12 years before he did To Sir With Love. He's excellent, as usual. 
As is customary with these movies, there's racial tension and raging hormones and cynical faculty, but this one has its own twists and a couple rough scenes, as the hostility Ford faces in the classroom comes a little too close to home. Mom and I also watched 1946's The Beast with Five Fingers, which is an atmospheric mystery thriller about an eccentric, rich, semi-paralyzed pianist who dies or is murdered, and his hand comes back from the grave seeking revenge. This was a fun movie. Robert Alda and Andrea King star, but it's Peter Lorre, as always, who gets the bulk of my attention when he's on screen. If we're talking bizarre old movies about killer hands, I definitely opt for Mad Love, another Peter Lorre movie over this one. That movie's awesome, and someday I'll review it. But this one, while it was no Mad Love, was pleasantly spooky and amusing at the same time. We also watched There Will Be Blood. This is a very popular movie, and it was very well made. Daniel Day-Lewis and Paul Dano both deliver strong, intense performances. I just didn't like it much. The good news is, I will never again get this movie confused with the other dark, disturbing Oscar contender from 2007, No Country for Old Men, which I'm surprised to find myself saying I liked better, but to each his own. And lastly, one of my favorite movies that I saw this past month, 2016's Hunt for the Wilder People. Set in New Zealand, Hunt for the Wilder People is about a troubled youth who's been passed around from foster home to foster home. He winds up at the home of an older couple played by Sam Neill and Rima Te Wiata. Incredibly, he starts to settle in there, but then something happens and he and his surly foster uncle end up alone together in the New Zealand bush, running away from a relentless child welfare worker. I kind of loved this movie. The kid, Ricky Baker, played by Julian Dennison, and Sam Neill as his reluctant foster uncle were both wonderful and so great together. It was a very funny movie with a heartwarming story. I laughed a lot and I definitely enjoyed it. Okay, that's it! Whew, that was exhausting. A lot of movies to cover. I hope you enjoyed the list and that you found something to spark your interest. Let me know what you think, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching!